Hello, Microbial Nation, and welcome to another episode of The Micro Moment. I'm Tess. And I'm John. And welcome, Micro Friends, for part two of our March Mead Madness series. Today, we're talking all about Saccharomyces cerevisiae. That's right. So if you didn't listen to our last episode, I highly suggest it. You are really missing out on some spit, vomit, blood, mead, humanoid, which becomes the vessel of all wisdom. And some horrifying origins of the term honeymoon. Well, at any rate, we are, of course, drinking more mead for our March Mead Madness. And with that, let's get going. All right. Where are we beginning, John? Obviously, we're talking about Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So what is Saccharomyces cerevisiae? It is yeast, and I'm not 100%. I believe there are several strains or species of yeast, but every time we say it today, we're talking specifically about Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, I think I have a few things that are general yeast, but mostly Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Okay. Well, yeast is a single-celled fungus that is found all over the world. It is, of course, responsible for rising bread and alcoholic beverages, such as mead, beer, and wine. Yum, yum, yum. And it's known as a facultative anaerobe, which means it can live with and without oxygen. We want to make a quick correction that part of our last episode, we said that it couldn't survive without oxygen. Our bad. It has even been found as part of the human gut microbiome. Really? Yeah. In remote populations, such as those found in French Guinea, not only have it, but it persists, establishing a residence in there. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. It usually reproduces asexually, where a little yeast buds off the side and grows until it pops off. In times of stress, yeast will create spores with half the genetic material needed, and that spore will fuse with another spore, creating a new yeast. And it has also been emerging as an infectious agent. Oh, yeah. I always forget that it it can cause diseases because it's just so beneficial all the time. This is a relatively new too. And pretty rare, right? Yeah. Is it mostly opportunistic? It is. So that means it affects mostly people that are immunocompromised. Hmm. There's also a condition out there called auto brewery syndrome. This is where yeast establish in the gut and produce alcohol after you eat, which makes people drunk and has been responsible for a DOI or two. That doesn't sound fun. I mean, half the fun of uh, drinking is the delicious tasting cocktails. Yeah, and you're trying to work and all of a sudden you become drunk. Yeah. It's not good times. Not ideal. And this occurs when the gut microbiome is out of whack, such as too much antibiotic treatment or if a person has intestinal issues. Mm -hmm. It can also be caused by uh, candidia species, which is another fungal species. Right. So should we dive into a little bit of history of our yeast friends? So yeast has been around humans for a long time. With some people estimating that we've been interacting for about 10,000 years. Wow. As we've said before, there's those pots with honey residue that are 7,000 years old in China. Mm -hmm. In fact, it is speculated that yeast are the reason people settled down and started communities. Aw. Yeast cause urbanization. And do you know why? Because mead makes us make friends. Not just that, but alcohol takes time to make. Oh, so you got to settle down and wait it out. And early villages had barley fields and grapevines. And so we get beer and wine. Exactly. There's even evidence that yeast originated in China. Yeah, I've read that. Yeah. On grape skin, right? Uh, Maybe. No, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that is what we use for alcohol fermentation, they believe originated in a China grape skin. Oh, okay. Uh, This article didn't go that detailed, but it was from The Atlantic uh, in 2018. And they reported that a team sequenced a thousand genomes of different yeast strains from very different environments to get the most genetic diversity. And I think they omitted alcohol producing yeast because those are heavily domesticated and kind of don't count. I wonder if yeast is the most domesticated organism ever Mm, it possibly could because there's so many strains out there yeah i think so it's probably one of the first things domesticated it's the most utilized domesticated thing domesticated before cats and dogs yeah and um 
cows and wheat, and wheat, yeah. and everything else. So this team found that China had the most genetically diverse the yeast. Huh. Yeah. And, you know, the thought is the more uh, genetically diverse the population is, is the stronger the theory is that's where it originated because it's had more time to change. To di- yeah, diverge over time. Yeah. It's also believed that yeast developed the ability to make alcohol several times independently from each other, too. I and mean, what does that mean? So that means, say, let's take the example. You said that uh, fermentation yeast came from a uh, grape in China. Mm-hmm. It's possible that, you know, as strains spread, I don't know, the, there was a strain in um, Africa that was growing on a fruit and was able to develop the ability to ver- uh, ferment, but never interacted with that strain in China. Oh, okay. Yeah. Also, the first rising breads came from Egypt. Uh, this was the time of pharaohs, possibly coming about by letting dough sit for long enough that yeast spores just fell on it. And they did their magic. And the Romans used beer froth to seed their breads. What is beer froth? That's like the foam at the top? Yeah, so fermenting beer, they're uh, top fermenters and bottom fermenters. And top fermenters, uh, the yeast stay on top and there's this like foamy substance. So they just scooped it and tossed it in with their bread. Mm, Okay. Yeah, and early European commercial yeast came from beer byproducts. So beer helped a lot of communities uh, make bread. Cool. There's more about yeast history, but we'll get back to that later. So we're going to talk about some products. Yeah, let's talk about some products. All right. So in case you're wondering, um, you probably use something that has been made by yeast every day of your life. So we should all love yeast. I will just be naming a few of the things that yeast makes. So, according to G.G. Stewart in the Encyclopedia of Food Microbiology, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is involved in the following. Wine, beer, cider, distilled beverages, bread, sweet bread, sourdough, bread, cocoa, fermented juices, honey, processed foods, products like juices, purees, fruit pieces, bakery products, fruit, yogurt, lebanese, brines, alcohol, beet, molasses, whey, growth on vegetable byproducts such as byproducts, flavor, carbonyls, phenol, ethanol, yeast extract, probiotics, Saccharomyces, Boulardier, fructose, fructose syrup, Manoproteins, glycanians, yeast glycans, yeast protein concentrate, invertase, ergocetrol, and glycans. And that's just in the food industry. Man, I hope you're you're trying to get that all in one breath, but that's way too much. Oh, I really tried. Maybe I should try again. <laughs> it's also used to create ethanol, organic acids, biofuel, amino acids, enzymes, insulin, and other therapeutic proteins that are involved in the treatment of ulcers, hep B, diabetes, Tdap, H, influenza, vaccines, human hemoglobin, even the plant system. We have our accommodate aquaporin P, FPS1 protein produced by the yeast to assist with drought. I can't wait to listen to that at three times the speed. Wow. <laughs> that was many mouthfuls. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeast are involved in Everything we do from medicine to what we eat to what we grow in our gardens. The yeast are a very important organism to our urban lifestyles. So I want to talk a little bit more about the biotech of yeast. So Saccharomyces is so important in biotech and molecular biology, right up there with our other microbial friend, E. coli. This is why it's not surprising it was the first eukaryotic genome to be completely sequenced way back in 1996, which means the genome is almost as old as my sister. My sister's got one year in the yeast genome. So, John, do you know what a eukaryote is? Is that an organism that has a nucleus around its DNA? Correct. Uh, So this is what kind of separates our yeast and our fungal friends from our bacterial friends. Bacteria do not have nuclei, whereas eukaryotes do store their genetic material in a kernel, which we call a nucleus. Here are a few other quick facts on the S. cerevisiae genome. It is made of 12,146,677 base pairs that makes up 6,275 genes across 16 different chromosomes. Here's another fun fact, because so much is known about the genome of yeast. Richardson and colleagues created a synthetic yeast genome. How cool is that? What does that even mean? Like they basically made a synthetic organism. Wow. 
So their results are published in Science under the title Design of Synthetic Yeast Genome. They really got creative with the title there, I got to say. But if you want to learn more, I suggest checking that paper out. So I read this review by Sabir Kumar Nandi and R.K. Srivastava called A Review on Sustainable Yeast Biotechnological Processes and Application. So kudos for them for making a very straightforward title. They note that one reason why Saccharomyces cerevisiae is so important today is because of the tools that have been developed throughout history. It has a wide variety of genetic tools. It's easy to grow to high density. It's fast to grow, making it the perfect little cell factory to produce whatever we want. Because there's so many strains and so much research, it's easy to find the strain that will work best for you. It's like wedding dress shopping. You go to the yeast boutique and pick out the style you like, and maybe you want a dress. I mean, a yeast that is more functional, that flowy, or has a particular element you are looking for, like will work in cooler weather. This comes and, and then you can do your alterations on your yeast to get the yeast to fit just right for your experiment. That is a great analogy. I wonder if there's any dresses out there that are based off of yeast. <laughs> Probably. Because we have all these genetic tools, it's not too difficult to call up the yeast seamstress and create the perfect dress for your wedding. I mean, yeast for your experiment. <laughs> not that you have a wedding on your mind right now or anything. No, 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 not at all. Yeah, I'm not preparing for a wedding or anything. Yeast is what we call grass, which means generally regarded as safe by the FDA, meaning it's not harmful to humans, which is why in the 1980s, we got the term biopharmaceutical, a therapeutic proteins produced synthetically, like through our yeast factories. Hmm. So the primary thing that yeast do on their own is fermentation. John, can you walk us through that process a little bit? All right, let's start with what fermentation is. It is the breakdown of substances or chemicals by microbes. In yeast, this is converting glucose into ethanol or alcohol and carbon dioxide, specifically in the absence of oxygen, and a process that gives the microbe energy. When this process is done in the presence of oxygen, it's called respiration. Actually, fermentation is derived from the Latin word fervere, meaning to boil because of the bubbles it produces during the fermentation process. Oh, that makes sense. Did you see what Saccharomyces cerevisiae translates to from Latin? I did not. Okay. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae translates in, in Latin, it literally means sugar fungus of beer. <laughs> that is amazing. Yep. I think that's the fact of this podcast. <laughs> it's a pretty good fact. All right, back to fermentation. Tell me more. All right. Well, fermentation doesn't always end in alcohol. Other microbes ferment it like bacteria, and that's where we get lactic acid for things like milk products turning into yogurt or cheese. And kombucha. And kombucha. Generally, there are other sugars around that the yeast have to break down in order to use, like disaccharides or two sugar molecules bonded together. And they accomplish this by an enzyme called alpha Glucosidase. Now, let's dive a little bit deeper into the actual steps of fermentation. How many steps are there? Uh, I'm going with the overview of two. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I guess there's lots of things where you can break it down into any discernible amount of steps that you want. Yeah, the first step, glycolysis, actually has 10 different chemical reactions, and that's mm. that's a subject for biochemistry, and we're not getting into that. Yeah, that's way too much for this one. What is glycolysis as an overview? So this is when the yeast breaks down glucose into two pyruvate molecules. And during this process, they gain energy along the way. And the next step is fermentation. This is a two-step process, where the first is when the pyruvate is converted to acetaldehyde by pyruvate decarboxylase, which kicks off two carbon dioxide molecules as a byproduct. Bubbles! That's where the bubbles come from. Next, alcohol dehydrogenates, converts the acetaldehyde into two ethanol molecules. Alcohol! And thus we get our alcohol. 
And this kind of brings us into a history part two of this podcast. Ooh, another little history lesson. Yeah. In the early days of making alcohol, people didn't know that yeast was responsible. Because no one ever gives credit to microbes. Am I right? Right. And they didn't even know what microbes were. They only knew that tossing fruits and grains into a cover container for a while produced alcohol. And when the microscope was invented, Leon Hook observed yeast in beer. But he didn't think it was an organism at all at the time. He thought it was something like a starch or a chemical needed for fermentation. Which, to be honest, if you look at yeast, it kind of looks like it's a globular of something else. I can't necessarily fault him for that. I mean, and it does do a lot of the chemistry needed for fermentation. So technically not wrong. Yep, not wrong at all. Around 1835, both Charles Cagniard de la Tour, as well as Theodore Schwann, Friedrich Kutzing, and Christian Erksleben independently discovered that yeast were living. Wow, all those people independently? Or are they, some of them paired up? Yeah, uh, Schwann, Kurtzking, and Erksleben were all paired together. Oh, uh, okay. So Charles is on his own. Yeah, but that just proved that they were living. That had nothing to do with yeast making alcohol. But this is where, again, Louis Pasteur comes in. The great Louis Pasteur. He was able to show that yeast were responsible for turning glucose into sugar and that only microbes are responsible for fermentation. Yeah, microbes, get some recognition. Yeah, and it occurs without air. Furthermore, he was able to show that there were other products made during this process, including glycerol, succinic acid, and amylic alcohol, which each give different characteristics of fermented drinks. And he also showed that yeast needed to be alive. True debt. Since then, many strains of yeast have been domesticated, created through crossbreeding or through selection. In fact, the American Type Culture Collection, or ATCC, houses over 32,000 yeast genetic strains alone. Wow. That probably just fits in, like, what, a one filing cabinet drawer? Yeah, and I don't <laughs> even, I'm not sure, but I don't think this includes the ones used to make alcohol either. Really? Does it include any baker's yeast, like any bread yeast? They didn't specify, but they do take pride in how genetically diverse and manipulable that they are. So I think it's specifically for scientific reasons. Mm, the biotech stuff. Yeah. And this kind of brings us into what a yeast life cycle is during fermentation. Mm -hmm. So first, there's pitching. This isn't a true phase. And in terms of homebrewing, it's a debatable step. Pretty much it's adding yeast to water to rehydrate and become active. Some will pitch it and then add it to their mixture of water and nutrients and let it ad adapt before making alcohol. Others don't bother and just toss these straight into what they're making alcohol in. Some will pitch it and then toss it in. So I have done just tossing in and letting it grow overnight. And so far, I don't really see the difference. So I think it's more of a dealer's choice at this point. Mm -hmm. Then you enter the lag period. This is where the yeast adapt to the surroundings and start gathering the nutrients for replication. And then we jump into the next step, which is respiration or the log phase. This is where they just go crazy and replicate all over the place. They, you know, they're munching all those nutrients. They're using up all the oxygen to create lipids, amino acids, again, reproducing everything. So this is their little yeast feast. Yeah. And I think they can get up to like, 10 million to a billion cells per microliter. Wow, really? Yeah. That's dense. It was a 10 to 10th. So, wow. They're active. They're going all over the place. And then once all the oxygen is used up, that's when you start getting into the fermentation phase. And the priority of the yeast changes from replication to fermentation, our favorite part. Mm -hmm. There is some fermentation in the respiration phase, but the majority of it occurs here. Also, there is some replication, but again, most of it occurs in the previous phase. This process continues until the sugar is all used up, the alcohol tolerance is reached, or both. Uh, yeast can only tolerate so much alcohol, and this varies from strain to strain. And then, last but not least, you get flocculation. That's when the yeast start to die or go into dormancy, and they'll clump together and settle at the bottom. 
You can also select for higher alcohol tolerance during this time by adding sugars and some of the yeast will survive and adapt to higher alcohol content and just boosting the ABV in your uh, drink. But eventually they all die and settle out. And at the end, we get our delicious alcoholic beverages. Can you tell us about some of those beverages? Yeah, so I'm going to talk about my favorite alcohol, which is, of course, wine. S. cerevisiae is actually not the dominant yeast on grape skin. That role goes to yeast like Hanna and Candida and Cleovoromyces. But during fermentation, S. cerevisiae destroys all the other yeast and becomes the prime time fermenting queens that they are. Destruction. Destruction. This is because fermentation creates the perfect home for S. cerevisiae. It's a little anaerobic, a little acidic, a little nutrient depletion. Sounds nice, huh? Yeah. I think of it as a little vacation on a tropical island myself. Yeah. So S. cerevisiae wine strains have also been domesticated and selected for to produce better wine. Commercial wine strains typically have higher fermentation efficiencies, having a high alcohol tolerance, and are less fragile than natural strains. Are you ready for this number? Lay it on. How many wine yeasts do you think there are? I don't know. Maybe 100 at this point? There are over 200 commercial wine yeast. Wow. This different yeast all have different properties, aromas and flavor properties that add to the overall terroir of the wine. So they have produced yeast that can handle more stress or reduce foam formation because no one wants foamy wine. They may also have wines that produce lower alcohol content. They also have yeast that may produce antimicrobials to keep the wine from spoiling or being contaminated with other microbes that may change the flavor profile. They may also make yeast to try and boost the health properties of wine, like yeast that can yield higher quantities of resveratrol, which is a plant antioxidant. No, why aren't they selling that at like vitamin shop or GNC? Oh, I think they do, but it's mostly crap. Like it's one of the ingredients in a lot of the multivitamin vitamins or the powders that you can get at GNC and stuff. Well, why don't they just forego that and sell the wine itself? <laughs> <laughs> well, because wine doesn't have the ultimate health properties. So, John, why don't you tell us about your favorite alcoholic beverage? Your new your new recent obsession, microbial obsession. You mean mead? Sure. I can't add too much to this because pretty much mead uses wine or champagne yeast. Usually white wine yeast, right? You can have white wine, you can have champagne. There's also red wine yeast you can use. Hmm. And this will give you an ABV of 14 to 18% or higher. Each strain ferments at different temperatures depending on the strain you use. These strains can do very little to the honey profile to accentuating it. And they can even add fruity flavors or aromas and even can affect mouthfeel. What? Mouthfeel. What is mouthfeel? I don't know if I can describe it. It's just like, how the drink the texture of the drink feels in your mouth oh okay yeah i guess that's different <laughs> trust me like all the lit like the a lot of the literature of me that i've been reading has like gone after mouthfeel all right so mel- mouthfeel is to me like terroir is to wine yeah exactly all right i get it and of course we have beer yeast Let's start with ale yeast. This encompasses both Belgian and wheat strains. They don't produce phenolic taste, which is like a clove or medicinal taste. And they produce fruity beers. Wheat beer can produce a wide variety of flavors, including banana in some strains, which I'm down for. Belgian yeasts produce earthy flavors as well as esters and phenol flavors. And then you also have lager yeasts. These brew at lower temperatures, which inhibit wild yeast and bacterial growth, which is, you know, beneficial. Doesn't produce as much fruity flavors or that boozy pungent notes. And is also known as a bottom fermenter, which means it settles to the bottom and starts fermenting. That's what I was talking about, bottom and top fermenters earlier. Bottom feeder. (laughs) And of course, you also have stouts, brown ale, imperial stouts, which can reach 
8 to 12% alcohol volume, IPAs, and there's more. And so we cannot end a podcast about Saccharomyces cerevisiae or yeast without talking about bread. Ooh, I love me some carbs. I completely forgot about bread on this one. Yeah. So a silver lining of COVID-19 pandemic was everybody and their mother got into bread making. This makes Delphine Sicard, a researcher at the French National Institute for Agriculture, Food, and Environment, wicked happy. She told the scientists, with this renewed interest in sourdough bread, we may be able to conserve more microbial diversity in the future, at least in the food chain. You see, Sicard published a paper last December looking at the genetic diversity of bread yeast strains. They analyzed the genomes of 17 bakery yeast strains with 1,011 other Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which was published in Nature in 2018, to create a phylogenetic tree. These bread strains are kind of a pain to study because they can be tetraploid. What? Wait, what does tetraploid mean? It means that they do not have two or three, but four sets of chromosomes. Oh, man, that's so much DNA. So much. So do you know what they found? I have no clue. They found that sourdough strains had higher copies of proteins that transport and regulate maltase and isomaltase. These break down the sugars, maltose and isomaltose. Makes sense. Furthermore, they found that the yeast do group distinctly into industrial strains for large-scale bread making and artisanal strains for homemade sourdough yeast. And do you want to know how bread yeast compare with wine and beer yeast? Yeah, I'm curious about that. So they are actually quite different, even though they are the same species. Bread yeast can be tetraploid, where beer and wine yeast is usually diploid. So they have twice as many copies of chromosomes as beer and wine yeast. They also found that baker's yeast produces more CO2, which gives you that rise that we all love in our bread. But S. cerevisiae is not the only microbe making your bread. Lactic acid bacteria also play a role in this. Most commonly, lactobacillus species, which are also found in yogurts. So I read this other study by Julia Gould and colleagues, which I can't tell if it would be wicked fun or tormenting. Do you want to know what they did? I do want to know. What did they do? So they had this paper back in 2005 entitled Sourdough Bread Production with Lactobacilli and S. cerevisiae Isolated from Sourdoughs. They made seven different breads using different compilation of lactic acid bacteria and S. cerevisiae. They found the bread made with Lactobacillus amylophilus and S. cerevisiae was the best bread, while S. cerevisiae alone was the worst. So they got to potentially taste some good breads and then taste some really bad breads, although tasting was not part of their actual research. They had some other parameters that they looked at to determine which one was the best. (laughs) Still... I mean, that's the best lab I ever heard of. You know that they're eating all that bread at the end of the experiment. Yeah, but eating like loaves of bad bread. Someone will eat it. I guess it depends on how bad it is. They also note that lactic acid bacteria can increase shelf life and prolong staling. So it takes a village of microbes to raise a sourdough. (laughs) And of course, I couldn't end a section on sourdough without talking about... The Make Your Mouth Water Three Blocks Away Bakery of Boudin. I remember Boudin. That was some delicious bread. Oh, yeah. If you ever find yourself in San Francisco on Fisherman's Wharf, you have got to go get yourself a loaf of this sourdough. We practically lived on nothing but this sourdough for like four days, and we had no regrets. Besides the bread itself, their biggest claim to fame is they tout their sourdough starter has been the same since 1849, when Isidore Bodine opened the bakery. Now, same is a little misleading when you're talking about microbial society that pops out a new generation every hour or so. Still, it's impressive that they kept their microbial friends kicking for 172 years. I also just want to say that I've eaten from Boudin's that wasn't in San Francisco and in the airport, completely different. You got to go to the original place. Yeah, buddy. Faux show. 
Well, my microbe friends, we hope you enjoyed our little yeast feast episode and now have a new appreciation for your yeast friends. And if you still don't like yeast, who are you? The devil? I mean, the devil and alcohol, I think, are pretty good friends. That is true. So basically, everyone loves yeast. Yay! (laughs) Yay! Don't forget to join us next week where John interviews a mead magician. He makes mead and then he makes it disappear. But seriously, it's a great interview and we really think you'll enjoy it. So don't you miss it. Just hit the subscribe or follow on whatever platform you're listening to us right now. As always, if you have any micro friends or homebrewing friends or just any friends, people still have those, right? I think so. Well, in any case, consider sharing this with them. Your kind words keep us doing this, which we love and we hope you love too. Got suggestions? Got more yeast facts? Hit us up on Twitter, Reddit, or Instagram at Microbiales. Not social? Not a problem. Send us a Gmail at Microbiales at gmail.com. That's M-I-C-R-O-B-I-G-A-L-S at gmail.com. We hope you keep listening and we hope you keep making microbial friends wherever you yeast expect it. Bye! Bye.